Welcome, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And yes, welcome to this webinar organized by EADS, the Bass Center for Language Technology. Uh, this talk is part of the EADS Language Technology uh, webinar series. Uh, this month, maybe you can pass the, to the night. Yes, to the, yeah. Okay, this month we have with us Martin Cook. Uh, thanks, Martin, for accepting our invitation to give uh, this talk today. Um, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Martin Cook. Uh, he's an expert in speech perception and recognition. Uh, he's currently here in, uh, as an Iker Basque research professor. He's a member of the Language and Speech Laboratory uh, at the University of the Basque Country in Vitoria. Okay, so he has come here after working at the National Physical Laboratory and also the University of Sheffield in UK. And he has dedicated his career to investigating the complex processes involved in speech perception, developing uh, innovative techniques for robot speech recognition, and analyzing the auditory scene. And he is also interested in the effect of noise uh, in speech production, perception, and also in second language listening. So um, let's welcome Professor Martin Cook uh, to the webinar. And Martin, uh, you can start whenever you want. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Share my screen. Let's see. Okay, can you can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much, Eva, for that introduction and for inviting me to give one of these uh, talks. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. So, as as you know, hardly a day goes by when we don't hear about the opportunities and also the threats of AI and in particular, big data and large language models. And in a sense, this talk is a sort of antidote to, to all of that. And it's really talking about how listeners cope with forms of speech that they have never heard before, and in particular, how quickly they adapt. So do we need hours? Do we need minutes? Do we need seconds? Well, that's what this talk is, is all about. So I'm going to talk about what distorted speech is and why it's interesting to study something that we never encounter in, in real life, really. And I'll be reviewing some of the distorted speech types that have been developed over the years and really to give me a chance to introduce some of the distorted speech that I'm going to be uh, using in the experiments. And then I'll talk about some work that we published last year, which was quantifying how quickly listeners do adapt to previously unheard forms of speech. And then I'll, in the latter part of the talk, talk about some recent experiments that are not yet published, uh, where we're trying to tease apart potential mechanisms or the locuses of adaptation in, in the humans. So my definition of distorted speech, and this is probably different from some other um, scientists, but essentially it's speech which has been artificially generated, but that lies outside our everyday experience. Um, and this is really to be contrasted with degraded speech, which would include things that do, does form part of our normal experience. So reverberant speech, speech in noise, telephone band limited speech, etc. those sorts of things. So this is an example of uh, distorted speech. I don't expect you necessarily to, to understand any of that at the minute. Um, and that, I contrast that with degraded speech. This is an example of reverberant speech. This travel shall I fear. Recorded in this case in a bathroom, not my bathroom. Um, but so that's an example of form of speech, which is also challenging, but which is also forms part of our daily experience. So why should we study something that's outside our daily experience anyway? Um, well, first of all, because as you'll see, listeners are pretty good at adapting to these forms of speech. And therefore, it's necessary for anybody interested in understanding human speech perception to explain why is that the case. We need to be able to account, not just for canonical speech, but for those forms of speech too, 
And who knows, it's possible that by understanding distorted speech, we'll learn something about normal speech perception. I strongly believe that we will. Now, in addition, there's a practical reason because some forms of distortion, such as noise evocated speech, which I'll talk about in a little while, they were actually constructed um, to simulate the kind of information that a, a hearing impaired listener might be getting if they're using some kind of hearing device. And also something that the title of the talk alludes to is that distorted speech might be a kind of battleground on which we can really see some differences between human and automatic speech recognition mechanisms. So just to start reviewing some of the forms of distorted speech that have been used in the past century, I guess it all started in Bell Labs with Harvey Fletcher and his colleagues who were trying to work out um, what kind of bandwidth was necessary to send speech down telephone lines. And what they did was to use some very extreme forms of low and high pass filtering, which wouldn't necessarily have been determined as distorted speech at the time, but we can now recognize as some of the earliest forms of distorted speech. And another example is the pattern playback uh, machine that some of you might have seen. You can see it on the website at Haskins, for instance. And this is where speech perception researchers were in investigating cues to speech, for instance, distinguishing between um, voice and voiceless flows lips. What they would do would, would be to paint, literally paint onto acetate, formants, bursts, and so on. And then using a kind of inverse spectrograph would then resynthesize the speech from that form. And that's heavily distorted forms of speech. But actually most of the forms of speech that we saw in the early days were in the temporal dimension because it was relatively easy to generate them. Remember, these are really largely pre-computer days, pre-software days. So here's a couple of examples then. This is an example of infinite clip speech, which is where every speech sample is forced to either one or zero. And it sounds like this. These days a chicken leg is a rare dish. Clearly distorted, but at the same time intelligible. And another temporal domain example of distorted speech is interrupted speech, where half of the speech signal is missing, this time in the time domain. And of course, we vary the duty cycle of the, the interval that's missing each time to understand something about the size of speech units. And it sounds like this. These days, a chicken leg is a red dish. Which again, is intelligible after some experience. So moving on a few years, approaching the kind of golden age, if you like, of distorted speech, perhaps, um, there were some pretty interesting forms of speech developed in the 60s and 70s, particularly spectrally rotated speech. I don't have an example of this, unfortunately. But spectrally rotated speech is speech where the, the high frequencies are mapped to the low frequencies and vice versa. It's really quite a tricky one for listeners to, to handle. Perhaps the most well-known form of distorted speech is sine wave speech. And I'll play you an example of that now. So sine wave speech is where um, either the two or the first two or the first three formants are traced out, and then their frequencies and amplitudes are mapped onto resonators that follow uh, those formants. So you can see that in this sort of auditory spectrogram above. You can see in this case, it's the three formant sine wave speech. So here's an English example of that. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. Which might be intelligible to some people if you've heard sine wave speech before. And here's the Spanish uh, version. Okay, I'm hoping by the end of the talk, you'll understand that kind of thing. We'll see. So moving on to the 90s, largely, um, this was the decade of vocoded speech, um, particularly two forms of vocoding, noise and, and tone vocoded speech, which I'll play some examples of in a moment. It's also a time when um, the, the, there was a form of speech developed which separated the fine structure and the envelope structure of signals, um, chimeric speech. And this has allowed, for instance, uh, researchers to take two signals, say a speech and a music signal, and swap their time structure and their envelope structure in order to see which of those two forms of structure in speech is important, most important for speech perception. There's also local time reversal developed around about them, uh, which I've got an example of here. Uh, so this is one of the forms of speech we're going to use in the experiments. So in local time reversal, what, what that means is that contiguous segments of speech are simply reversed. No windowing, no nothing. And in this, ca this case, I think it's about 70 millisecond segments. So each 70 millisecond is simply reversed and then reconcatenated. So it sounds like this, again, an English and a Spanish example. 
The Dutch canoes slip on the smooth planks. On Spanish. So noise vocoding is a very important technique. So noise vocoding is where we split the signal into, we filter the signal into a number of bands, usually between two and 20 bands. And then the, the signal in each band is um, replaced by a carrier, in this case, a noise carrier, which is then takes the envelope out of that filter. And so the, you've got a noise carrier and the envelope out of the filter, and we simply add all of those things together. So we're essentially re removing or modulating the amount of spectral detail and particularly removing fundamental frequency, uh, largely speaking, certainly if we use a low number of bands. And so you, you should hear this as a kind of a harsh whispered speech. And a Spanish example. And tone mocoded is essentially the same thing, except rather than using a noise carrier, we're using a, a static sinusoidal carrier. The birds can sleep on the smooth planks. The last 10 or 15 years or so, the focus has largely been on more complex spectrotemporal manipulations. So some of the stuff I was doing with glimpses would fall into this category. There's all sorts of interestingly named um, distortions here, pointillistic speech, bubble speech, auditory sketches, various things. And a new form of um, distortion, which I was working on a couple of years ago, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment, sculpted speech. So first of all, let me just remind people, I think by now, maybe some people have seen this for the first time. This is how I go about um, synthesizing speech from glimpses. So the, the basic idea is we take a speech and a noise signal. We determine where the speech is, is more energetic than the noise in an auditory time frequency sense. And that results in a mask. This is the mask over here. And then to synthesize speech from this, we will put the, the mixed signal, the speech and noise signal, through the mask. And what that really means is we just turn the signal on in those filters where there's a glimpse. So it's turned on and off wherever you see these dark regions. And that results in something like this. So I'll just play you the original mixture and then the noise, and then the result of doing glimpse synthesis. A rod is used to catch pink sand. A rod is used to catch pink sand. Which you can see actually removes some of the information, but also clear, cleans it up quite a lot. Okay, that's kind of old hat by now, but the new idea, what I call sculpted speech, is where we recognize that rather than putting a speech or speech plus noise signal through the mask, we can actually put any signal we like through the mask. And I'm not going to tell you what this signal is I'm putting through the mask. Try, you can try and guess. Uh, but there's, we, we simply use exactly the same mask as before, put any signal through it, and we end up with a signal which we call sculpted speech, because in a sense, the mask is sculpting the speech out of whatever this mystery signal is. So see if you can guess what the signal is in this case. And I'm guessing you can't because it's very difficult to tell actually. What, we, what that, that, that signal was that you're listening to, and, and I want to stress that the only thing you're listening to there was this signal you're about to hear that has been kind of cut up according to speech is this. So a, a Cuban polyphonic stretch of music. And it's kind of interesting for two reasons. One is that speech is still intelligible when we do this. And secondly, that the, given that there's no speech in there at all, and secondly, that the music kind of disappears. It's, it's been dominated by the speech. So well, a Spanish example as well. I mean, knowing now that as you do that, that's music, you could probably tell there's a bit of music in there. That was actually a Wagner opera that was um, sculpting that, that bit of speech. Okay, so that's all I want to say about um, the background to different types of distortion. And now I want to just have a, a little bit of a fun non-scientific interlude on ASR and distorted speech. And the, the question is, how does something like this handle variability? And we're going to start with normal variability. And that is the kind of variability that you might, this thing might meet in normal speech, everyday speech. So you're going to listen to some examples of me saying the Alexa wake up um, sign. And then we'll see how well it does. Alexa, 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 Alexa. So it's me trying to be depressed or happy or whatever. And 
as you'd expect, these things sell, they work, um, and it does pretty well. In fact, it only failed on two. One was when I had an extreme intonation, and the other was when I was actually not produ producing the word Alexa properly. You might have noticed one was unreduced in a phonological sense. So it does pretty well. Now, you know what the next question is going to be. How does this thing handle distorted speech? And so I uh, dug out my uh, Python library of creating distorted speech. There's actually more types than that I showed you so far, it's about 15 types. I'll just play you them and then let's see how it does. Alexa, 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 Alexa. How well does it do? Well, surprisingly, a couple of those it does quite well on. Um, it nearly always gets interrupted speech right, and it gets the local time reversed stuff occasionally right. So I repeated this a few times. Um, that's not perhaps too surprising because the short term spectra of the, both of those types of distortion is rather similar to normal speech. But for the rest, it's a big no no. So this needs to be repeated properly, of course, and that's the kind of a challenge that I'm going to lay down for people who are doing ASR these days, which is not me. Um, but I have. I, have been a few studies of ASR and distorted speech. So John Barker, when he was doing his PhD at Sheffield, was interested in a number of problems to do with sine wave speech. And he tried to get a recognizer to recognize sine wave speech. Now, of course, if you ask a, a recognizer that's been trained on natural speech, normal speech, to if you test it on sine wave speech, then you get something like 5%. This is not an error rate, this is a word correct. Um, Whereas if you train a recognizer on sine wave speech, we can see there's information is present in there. So you're going to get 80%, which in those days, this is an early kind of HMM based system. So on natural speech, trained on natural speech, it was still getting a 10% error rate. You can see it's not doing too badly uh, there. So the information's there. It's just that trying to use the same recognizer for these two forms of speech, which is the situation for humans when we throw sine wave speech at them, um, doesn't work very well. There's also a more recent study looking at noise and tone vocoded speech. And we see the results here. So this was a recognizer that was trained on natural speech, had 93% accuracy. Again, it was an HMM recognizer. And this is the number of bands or channels in the noise vocoder. Of course, as you increase the number of channels in a noise vocoder, it increasingly looks like normal speech. So you'd expect to see recognition improve. And indeed we do see recognition improve. But recognition is still very low for four bands where humans are getting pretty good scores with noise vocoded speech. Okay, so now what I want to do is to look at some of the behavioral studies that we've carried out there, looking at distorted speech. And in particular, we're looking at adaptation. And adaptation has a simple definition. It's just, what are the gains in intelligibility due to exposure? So you typically measure performance, for instance, on a sentence task at the beginning, and you compare it with the end of a block, let's say, of 30 or 40 or 50 sentences and, and look at what the gain, gain is in that situation. Now, this kind of adaptation has been tested with lots of forms of speech, not just distorted speech, but also what I might call non-canonical speech, that is speech which we're going to encounter in our everyday life occasionally or perhaps even frequently these days. So things like synthetic speech, reverberant, noisy, accented speech but also a whole host of different kinds of distorted speech. And there's been reports of adaptation in all of these forms of distorted speech. So humans are pretty good at adapting to things which they've not heard before, basically. But the key question for us was how, how does that adaptation, what does it look like? How fast is it essentially? And if you pick up any of those studies and you drill down into the papers, you'll see it always is always described as fast or rapid or resulting from brief exposure, but the details tell a different story. Often fast for one scientist can mean minutes rather than hours, for instance. For others, it might be several seconds and so on. So it's important to look at how much speech is involved. Now, most studies have used blocks of sentences and then compared blocks. And those blocks might have five, 10, 20 sentences in them. So here's a couple of studies. This is from uh, Richard Warren's lab, um, looking at adaptation to spectral bands of speech, which is another one of the conditions that you'll be seeing in one of my studies. So these are blocks, and there are 10 sentences per block, 
and we see the different bands, we see a clear improvement with time. So that's what I mean by adaptation there. This is another early study looking at adaptation to a fast speech, two different rates of, of, of speed, two different speeds of speech. And again, we see blocks here. These are blocks of five sentences. Now, a few studies have started to look at a finer time scale. In fact, going back to 2005, Matt Davies and colleagues looked at noise vocoded speech. This was actually just one of many experiments, and, the, and the, the, the study was not really designed to look into this question of, of what the fine time course is. And so the best fit they found was a linear time course, a gradual improvement. But the important innovation here was that results were being examined at the level of individual sentences. Similarly with Julia Erb and colleagues, again, looking at noise vocoded speech. And again, we saw, or they saw a linear fit in that case. Now, more, more or less at the time that um, we were doing the study I'm, I'm going to talk about in a moment, um, there was a conference paper which reported the first indications of something other than linear adaptation. So this was non-linear adaptation from Van Hedger and colleagues. Um, this was not just for distorted speech, but for also computer speech and, and speech in noise, speech in babble. You can see a clear non-linearity in those cases. So the study I'm going to talk about, so it was published last year, carried out with Odette Scharenborg from Delft, Delft University and Bernd Mayer from Oldenburg University. Um, what we, our goal was, was to use um, sufficiently powerful experiments, as is essentially a large number of listeners, to be able to see what was really going on at the sentence level for different forms of distorted speech, and also to see whether adaptation to one form of speech helped in the adaptation to other forms of speech. So we use Spanish listeners, these were experiments carried out basically where I'm sitting at the moment. Um, just before COVID, we had about 70 people through, um, finished on February the 28th, which was the day I think was the first case in Victoria. And so we just got this one through. And um, so these were Spanish sentences from the Charvard corpus, which is like the IEEE sentences in, in Spanish or the Harvard sentences. So listeners simply typed what they heard and there were five keywords a sentence. We tested eight forms of distortion, and I'm also showing in the top left here the undistorted form. These are all cochleograms or auditory spectrograms. And these are all of the same sentence. So you can see they look very different, don't they? And that's because they're essentially very varied forms of distortion. There were various parameters um, chosen. Of course, each of these forms of distortion could be parameterized in different ways. So for instance, for sine waves, we can choose two or three. For noise vocoding, we can choose the number of bands, et cetera. So these are just some of the details there. One important thing that we wanted to avoid was measuring or confounding adaptation to the talker. So listeners were exposed to 15 sentences at the beginning of the test with the same talker, undistorted, in quiet. So this is to ensure that any adaptation that we observed was due to the distortion and not to the talker. Now, critically, as it turns out, listeners were not familiarized with the distortion prior to the main experiment. So the first time a listener heard, let's say, sign wave speech would have been when they were sitting down in, the, in one of the booths over here. Um, and that was the first stimulus in the main experiment, depending on the counterbalancing of the conditions, of course. Some listeners would hear noise vocoded first, et cetera. And listeners received no feedback at all. So there was essentially no training, if you like. So let's look at the results. What do we get? Well, this is what we got. And what I'm doing is I'm plotting the results across all conditions, averaged across all conditions, as a function of sentence position. And these are for individual sentences. And what's, what we see in global terms is that listeners were getting one in three keywords correct in the first sentence and two and three keywords correct in the 30th sentence. That's very clear adaptation. It's a halving of the error rate, if you like. But what's, I think, more interesting is that half of the adaptation was achieved by the time they reached the third sentence. So what we see is very rapid adaptation at the beginning, followed by a more gradual adaptation. And various um, three parameter fits were tested, and um, it turns out that log fit was the best. And from the use fits, we can compute various parameters. 
Um, one of them is the what I call T50, which is the number of sentences to reach 50% of the eventual gain. So in this case it was 2.7 sentences. So after 2.7 sentences, half of the adaptation had occurred. So the first thing to say about this result is that previous studies that have analyzed by blocks have really seriously underestimated the speed of adaptation, not only the speed, but also the degree. So just to illustrate that, what I'm doing here is to plot, first of all, the bottom here, this is the data you've just seen, and we see there's a gain of 35 percentage points. But then if I were to block that data, to analyze that by blocks, so this is just blocks of two, then blocks of three, five, 10, 15, so block of 15 will be the first half versus the second half, you can see not only do we lose the rapid adaptation in the curve itself, but if you look at these gains, we're really under-reporting the gains, in, in fact, by a factor of four, from analyzing on a sentence by sentence basis to analyzing on first half, second half basis. So why might rapid adaptation have been missed previously, um, notwithstanding the point about blocks? Well, I think there's a simple explanation, and I've not looked into this in detail yet, um, but I've looked, just the first two studies I picked up illustrate, I think, a likely reason, and that is that listeners are typically familiarized with the conditions of the main experiment prior to the main experiment. So this is the data on spectral uh, slits. So you can see here, before beginning the actual experiment, listeners were presented with speech that would filter in the same manner. And here, this is a different study looking at cochlear implant simulated speech and speech and babble. And again, before the experimental trial, participants were familiarized. So given that um, our results suggest that most of the rapid adaptation takes place in the first three, four, five sentences, then a re even a very short familiarization section, session is going to kind of suck out all of the rapid adaptation. You're just not going to see it. So what about the individual distortion types? Well, rapid adaptation is apparent, as you can see here, for most of the distortion types. The only one where we didn't see it was for, for glimpse speech. We saw it for all of the others. Now, the rate varied a little bit. So for sine wave in particular, for tone vocoded speech, the rate was relatively slow compared to noise vocoded, fast speech, etc. Now, you might think that the amount of adaptation that you're going to see is going to depend on the intrinsic difficulty of the condition. What I mean by intrinsic difficulty is you've got to imagine that you grow up on a, on a planet, let's say, where the only thing you can hear is sine wave speech. Now, pretty rapidly, you're going to reach, you're going to max out in, in the intelligibility of sine wave speech. Presumably, if you grow up on such a planet, then intelligibility will be very high, but you know what I mean. So the Essentially, the asymptotic or the intrinsic intelligibility of the speech can be defined. We can more or less see what's happening by looking at what's happening at the end of the block. Some of these were still going up, so this would be tone coded and sine wave speech. But you can see it's kind of heading for the similar zone here. So six of the eight forms of speech actually had a very similar asymptotic intelligibility. But this initial sentence intelligibility varied uh, wildly across a, a great range. So it wasn't really the intrinsic difficulty of the condition that led to the amount of adaptation, but um, something else. Now, because we tested lots of different forms of adapted speech, we could correlate listener performance in the different conditions. Um, so what we found when we looked at, for instance, the raw intelligibility or mean intelligibility across the different conditions was correlations all over the place. So these are correlation coefficients and these are p-values. So they're mostly significant, mostly highly significant. That is not particularly surprising, though. And we often find in previous experiments with speech and noise that one listener who's good at speech and noise tends to be good at another condition of speech and noise. That's all this is saying here. I think what's more revealing is looking at the gains in adaptation. That is, does a listener who does well, for instance, who improves a lot on sign wave speech, also improve a lot on noise vocoded speech? or one that doesn't do so well on sine wave speech also doesn't do so well on noise vocoded speech equally, they would be correlated. And the answer is really no, largely speaking. There's only really one pair here which survives multiple condition comparison, that's tone vocoded and sine wave speech. So listeners that are good at one or bad at one tend to be good or bad at that. And that's kind of interesting in a sense because they're both carried by similar carriers based on sinusoidal carriers. 
Now, this rapid adaptation has also been observed with non-distorted speech in the past. So, for instance, accented speech. This wasn't using intelligibility, but looking at react response time. Uh, listeners needed two to four sentences to, to really get used to accented speech in this study. Reverberant speech, uh, measured using speech reception thresholds in this study. This need about two sentences of exposure to room acoustics um, before um, they were essentially asymptoted in the improvement. And similarly for different speakers. So the interesting question I think is, what kind of mechanisms might underlie this kind of rapid adaptation? Well, first of all, are we seeing single or multiple mechanisms? What we're certainly seeing is a, a rapid phase followed by a gradual phase, but is that just a case of diminishing returns? Is it a single mechanism? Or maybe there's more than two mechanisms. Maybe there's an initial uh, stimulus issue. Um, what previous time I've given a similar talk was called the WTF effect. Um, and maybe that maybe that's what's going on. Maybe there's a sort of a surprisal, just seeing hearing something you've never heard before and knocks you off balance. But then we also see continuous um, it's not just the first stimulus, we see the first two or three sentences, we see adaptation. So how many mechanisms are there? Also, um, do the mechanisms reside in early, maybe an auditory phase, auditory stage? Possibly not at the cochlear level, but maybe post-cochlear in the auditory brainstem. Are they pre-lexical, post-cochlear, so maybe phonological in nature? Or are they? do they require listeners to understand the words? So that's what some studies I'm going to be talking about in a moment have been designed to tease apart some of those things. But um, just to mention three possible adaptation mechanisms, and these were suggested by Azad Poor and Malaban. Um, one thing that listeners might be doing is trying to transform or uh, compensate or find the inverse transformation of a particular distortion. So if you take something like speech rate, if you've got a fast speech rate, what listeners might do is to sample at a more rapid rate, sample formant or spectral information to more rapid rates, and then use that rapidly sampled information to um, contact the previously learned representations, and that would do pretty well. What um, Azapur and Balab Balaban tried was uh, to use this as an explanation for the findings with spectrally rotated speech. Now, spectrally rotated speech is very difficult for listeners, but if listeners were capable of doing a transformation, it's a very simple transformation to envisage, isn't it? Mapping high to low frequency and vice versa. But there's no evidence for that in that particular case. And that would be a fairly low level mechanism, I think. And then there's the possibility that what listeners are doing is looking at what is being stimulated, um, what neural mechanisms are being stimulated, or neural assemblies being stimulated by the distorted speech, and then selecting those which are least degraded. So. In the case of sine wave speech, the formants, the first two or three formants, are actually being activated more or less as they would be for natural speech. It's just the rest of the spectrum isn't. So that's a case where you might, a selection mechanism might work well. But perhaps the, the area which has seen most work has been lexically guided perceptual learning. And lexically guided perceptual learning is a little bit different from what we've been looking at here in that most of the, the studies of perceptual learning have used um, a different paradigm where listeners are exposed in a, so it's a two phase uh, experiment. In the first phase, listeners are exposed to sounds which are deviant. And so there, for instance, it might be uh, a, a sound which is intermediate between a, a, an S and an ESH, for instance. And that those sounds are embedded in words and also in non-words. And then in a second phase, listeners are do a categorization experiment, and what happens is that listeners appear to have shifted the boundaries to accommodate those deviant sounds, which is rather like a listener might do when listening to mispronounced sounds in, in uh, non-native speech, for example. The problem with this idea is that it's been estimated that listeners need about 10 exemplars of each sound. Um, so it's very difficult to see how that would explain the rapid phase. So in a few sentences, you're not going to get 10 examples of each sound across the wide spectrum of sounds. So that's a, a possibility, but it's, it's very likely, I think, that lexically guided perceptual learning will explain the gradual phase and the results we're seeing. But we're trying to explain the rapid phase here. So I want to mention now four um, follow-up studies 
so far unpublished, trying to tease apart some of these issues. Now, these were all done online. And back in 2020, um, we carried out a validation check, uh, basically a replication of three large scale experiments using an online platform just to check, particularly since we were dealing with distorted speech or speech and noise, which you might expect to be, you know, it's a bit different from many of the online experiments. We wanted to check whether or not we get similar results, which was published a couple of years ago. And indeed we, we do. So in fact, the, 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 the exper experiment I talked about, the rapid adaptation experiment is experiment one here, the blue dots, and you see they lie pretty much on the same line. This is web listener results versus lab listener results. And if we actually look at the adaptation curves in the lab, this is the one you saw before, and compare it with a completely different cohort using a completely different um, setup, their own machines, headphones, et cetera, we see a very similar curve. In fact, it's the same number of sentences, 2.7, gives us you know, half of the game. So having dispensed with that, we went ahead with some experiments, looking at um, trying to explain what's going on in the rapid adaptation phase. So one of the interesting questions is, does adaptation transfer between conditions? So for instance, if you're exposed to sine wave speech at an early stage in an experiment, does it help you when you're processing noise encoded speech or, or the other way around? If we see transference, that, that would suggest that listeners would form some kind of non-short-term representation, let's just put it like that, which can be used to process subsequent distortions. But an absence of transfer would suggest that rapid adaptation is a kind of an ongoing continuous process um, that doesn't necessarily result in any longer-term changes, perhaps similar to adaptations of room acoustics. So you're walking around, you, you maybe one moment you're in a free field, then you enter into a corridor, than into a, an amphitheater, et cetera, where the acoustics are different. Um, so it's a kind of an ongoing process. So which is it gonna be like? In fact, we can start to answer this question by looking at the earlier study, by looking at, because listeners were uh, counterbalanced across conditions, to look at whether listeners in a later block were doing better than, listen, or, sorry, the distortions heard in later blocks were perceived better than those at, uh, or more intelligible than those in earlier blocks. And it seems to be seems to be a bit of an effect here, but then it does also seem to be a potential fatigue effect at the end. This is over, over all distortions, but looking at all of the individual distortions is actually only a benefit in the sine wave case, statistically speaking. And something we couldn't really explain that those listeners that heard the fast speech at the very end actually suffered quite badly. This ties up with incomplete transfer found in an earlier study looking at whether noise vocoding and tone vocoded speech uh, cross transfer. So, so far the evidence is actually quite shallow for any kind of transfer. So what we decided to do was to choose a paradigm where listeners would have the best chance of transfer if there is indeed any kind of transfer. And that is using the same kind of distortion in each of the conditions, but just changing the parameter which defines the distortion. So we chose to use narrow spectral bands but simply chose four different center frequencies and then counterbalance them. So I'll just play you some examples of these. Um, and you can judge for yourself whether you think they're similar enough to be regarded as transferable skills. There we go. Starting with the uh, one kilohertz band. And this one. Marca el solar con un cartel con letras en rojo. That was what you should have heard of the full band. They're kind of similar in a way. They sound muffled in the same, same sort of way. So what do we see? Well, first of all, just taking all the bands together. So this isn't answering the question yet. This is just, in a sense, replicating the result. This is a new cohort. Again, we see rapid adaptation. So it's a very robust phenomenon. What we didn't see was any transfer effect at all. Um, so listeners who heard things in block one, um, a particular, um, in, the, in the first block of the experiment, I heard a particular band in the first block, showed a rapid adaptation, then gradual adaptation. Uh, they did a bit better in block two, but then were worse again in block three, and then a bit better in block four. So there's no clear evidence of a transfer effect here, which is maybe a bit surprising. So it seems that even when we're using the same distortion type, it ought to promote transfer if it exists, but here we, we, we really see seem to find that adaptation is condition specific. Now, it may be the case that spectral bands are too dissimilar. So what we're gonna do 
is to repeat this with different, different distortions, such as noise vocoded distortions. Now, another interesting question, I think, is um, how well do listeners adapt in a second language? Why this is important from a theoretical perspective is if adaptation or rapid adaptation is a low level phenomenon, then we would expect to see it whether we're listening to a first language or to a second language. On the other hand, if adaptation requires higher levels of speech knowledge, maybe phonological or lexical or both, um, then we would expect to see a native advantage, similar to the native advantage, which is very clearly shown for other forms of challenging speech condition. So what we did here was to use equivalent sentences. Uh, this, in this case, Spanish listeners all studying English here at the university, um, who said that the knowledge of English was pretty, pretty good, um, but English was a, a second language. And we made the conditions essentially equivalent, but easier. Um, in this in this task, um, just to ensure that performance was well above floor level. So when I say easier, for instance, rather than using six channel noise of coding, we'd use ten channel, which sounds like this. The fish twisted and turned on the bent hook. Rather than six channel. And a whole octave band we were generous with respect to a slit. The girl at the booth sold fifty bonds. Compared to a third octave, which was the case for the previous experiment. And we didn't have a fast speech, we just had a normal, plain, quiet speech. So we could look at the quiet to see how much speaker adaptation was going on. In fact, there's no talk of adaptation at all in quiet. Of course, not forgetting that they also got this 15 sentence practice, which is the same talk, different sentences. So we really should be looking at that. And although the log fit seems to suggest there's adaptation, in fact, there's no adaptation happening here at all, statistically. No, no, no adaptation in the quiet condition. What about the distorted conditions? Well, in fact, we do see some adaptation in the distorted conditions. Um, however, it's very rapid and it's a bit different from what we saw for native speech, native speech perception, that is. So this is very rapid adaptation, 1.3 sentences to reach half. So essentially it's just, just a first sentence effect almost here. It's also very limited in degree. Notice that the, the keyword score is very low here and it's not much higher at the end of 30 sentences. In fact, what's going on is that um, these are the individual adaptation curves for the seven conditions. I'm afraid this is a bit difficult to pull apart, but I just wanted to really make the point that there's no adaptation at all for four of the seven distortion types. And if we take two of the types where there is clear adaptation, it's still very rapid. In these two cases, noise vocoding, tone vocoding compared to native listening, where it's, it's much more gradual. So it looks as though, um, Adapting to a second language to second language speech is not quite the same as adapting to first language speech. So that again argues against a low level locus for rapid adaptation. One possibility, of course, a possible confound here is that we still didn't get the conditions at the similar level as native speech. It's actually quite difficult to pilot experiments like this uh, because what are you trying to do is you're not sure whether you're piloting to get the initial performance very low. You want the performance to be pretty low. You want to see lots of adaptation. So in a sense, what we were doing this time was, was a bit of a pilot. So we're going to run it again with slightly easier conditions for second language uh, learners. Now, the final pair of experiments both involved, um, I think, a critical question, which is asking the question of whether or not rapid adaptation requires listeners to understand words. We know for sure, pretty much for sure, sure as anything is, that the gradual adaptation to distorted speech is driven by lexical information. That was shown by Davies and colleagues some time ago. But what about the rapid adaptation? Given what I said a bit earlier about the fact that we seem to need, for at least for phonetic retuning, we need lots of exemplars of each sound that we're not going to get in these first few sentences, is it realistic to assume that rapid adaptation is also lexically guided. So what we did was develop a paradigm which involved using reversed speech as a kind of a primer and contrasting it with forward speech. The argument goes like this, that if we take reversed, let's say a sine wave speech, which sounds like, like this, It may be the case that what listeners are latching onto in the initial sentences is the form of the speech, the fact that it sounds in that kind of 
know, warbly sound, similar to the forward speech. So the two things have a form similarity. The difference is one is reversed, and therefore there are no words uh, perceivable in, in, in one. So if it's acoustic or auditory or low-level factors that underlie rapid adaptation, then we should see similar results if we expose listeners to reverse stimuli or forward stimuli. Whereas if it's lexical factors that are involved, we should see a difference between these two conditions. Of course, the big issue is how do we get listeners to respond sensibly to reverse speech? We don't. What we do instead is we use passive initial exposure. And what this means is that the first five sentences are listeners just listen to them and kind of forced to pause. There's a four or five second pause after each one. Um, of course, we can't force people to listen, but we assume they are listening and they don't respond. And then after the sentences six to 30, it's exactly the same as before, listeners respond to those sentences. So these five sentences are, should be enough to soak up any rapid adaptation. Then of course, we divide the cohorts into two, one, here's reverse stimuli, and the others here, normal direction stimuli. So what do we see? Well, these are the results for the reversed, uh, the, for the uh, participants who heard reverse stimuli to prime them. Now, the, the, the idea is if the reverse stimuli were getting rid of the rapid adaptation, if listeners were using them for rapid adaptation, then we shouldn't see any rapid adaptation when listeners start to respond. And we, we, we do appear to be still seeing some rapid adaptation there. But the real contrast is with the group who heard the forward stimuli. And what we see is a, is a clear difference here, that these listeners certainly appear to have adapted during the passive exposure far more than the, the, those that heard the reverse stimuli. So that does support the idea of a lexically based rapid adaptation, which to be honest, surprised me quite a lot. However, when we look at the different distortions, we see different effects. So for instance, noise vocoding shows the same pattern as the overall distortions. We see benefit for the forward stimuli, but sine wave speech, we see no benefit. In fact, these are statistically equivalent. So that might imply that, that certain kinds of distortions, such as this sine wave speech, are adapted to whether it's reversed or not. So it's based on kind of form similarity. Whereas others like noise vocoding may require these, the, the extraction of words. So how do we test that? And this is the final experiment I'm gonna talk about. Um, what we did was to note that we were using two form of sine wave speech, but we can make sine wave speech more intelligible by using three form of sine wave speech. It's actually quite a lot more intelligible. Now, if it's the form that listeners are using during rapid adaptation, then it shouldn't matter whether we're using two or three form of sine wave speech. But if listeners show no lexical priming because it's two form of sine wave speech is too challenging, then we would expect to see a forward benefit when we use three form of speech because that is less challenging. So which is this? What do we see? That's two form of that's three formers. They're not that different, actually, in this particular case. This is what we see. And what we see, um, this is, sorry, this is looking over all distortion conditions. So this has not answered the question yet. This is just really a replication. Different group, different cohorts entirely. We see a clear benefit of forward exposure composed to reverse. But what's, what about the critical case of sine wave speech? Well, what we find with three form and sine wave speech is that it is much more intelligible, first of all, and that the forward benefit has now appeared. So that argues against it being a form-based uh, explanation for rapid adaptation, and it argues in favor of a lexically driven adaptation. So I just want to summarize all of these findings and talk about a few implications of them. So really, the speed of adaptation has been greatly underestimated in the past. And now we need different kinds of explanations, I think, to explain how listeners can really adapt in a few sentences, different forms of speech. Even so, you might expect rapid adaptation to involve auditory level processes to be mainly depend on those, but that does not seem to be the case. So rapid adaptation does appear to have a lexical basis, and that's shown both by the experiment with listeners listening in the L2, and also the reverse speech that we've just seen. 
And it does seem to be very condition specific. There's no evidence really, or very little evidence so far of transfer between conditions. So what does all this mean? Well, when you think about it, we're adapting all the time. We're adapting to new talkers, new accents, room acoustics, etc. It's not surprising that we're going to be using the same mechanisms when a evil experimenter starts throwing, you know, distorted speech at us. We've got nothing else to fall back on. And it's interesting that the same similar time constants of adaptation for rapid adaptation uh, are, are present in both cases. Now, I did something else uh, just when I was preparing this last slide, and I thought, why, I, why haven't I done this before? Because we've got five keywords per sentence, it's possible to actually ask the question, um, are we adapting on a word-by-word -word basis within sentences? So what I'm plotting here are the first, our individual word recognition um, scores. So there's five keywords per sentence, and you can see there's the same rapid adaptation, of course, you see the first word, second word, third word, we're already better off, fourth and fifth word, better off still. Now, this is either adaptation within a sentence or it's the use of sentential constraints. But these are, these are not semantically anomalous sentences, but they are actually semantically quite difficult sentences. So I think there's some adaptation going on even within the course of the first few sentences. And when we look at the uses to get an estimate, a better estimate of how many words we need to adapt, it turns out that it's even fewer. About nine words. So I, I'm hoping there's a few ASR people listening and uh, how ASR, current ASR, handles distorted speech is still an open question. Um, we've put the distorted speech corpus online so if you want to give it a go there it is. Don't forget you've got no training sets, no development set, no feedback, different situation than normal. Get the system set up, just chuck the sentences in and see how well it does. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Martin, for the talk. Now we have time for some questions. So, does anyone in the audience have uh, a question for our speaker? You can raise your hand by clicking in the icon. Yes. Miriam Schutz. No, sorry, I was trying to clap. I don't have a question, but thank ah, you very okay. much for the talk. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, or oh, you can write your uh, question in the chat also, if you want. Okay. And in the meanwhile, maybe I, I will ask you a curiosity that I have. Um, because do you think that People, multilingual people, maybe is more prepared to to handle these distortions because they they have had the to make the effort to learn and they have more um, an extended phonetic set and an extended lexical. And do you think this can be an advantage? Because I don't know if you you had uh, multilingual speakers and or bilingual speakers and monolingual speak, uh, listeners in your uh, in your experiments, but if some of them were multilingual, do you think this like, so this is a kind of an advantage? I think possibly that the listeners were were motivated. Um, so I should say that. Our online experiments were a bit different from those that are often reported. We weren't using a crowdsourcing platform. We were using, we were asking the listeners that would typically come physically to the laboratory to do these experiments. So that we, these were what we call known listeners. I mean, they were anonymous, of course, but they were known listeners. So they were all um, participants who, I say, would be the ones that would normally come along. So I think, yeah, and, and that's, I think, one of the important reasons why we get very similar results in the online and the lab, in the lab tests in general. I think that's quite important. We don't get any wastage in the same way that crowdsourcing experiments. You know, crowdsourcing experiments typically will have a, a wastage rate of anything up to 50%. So I think, yes, I think it, it's probably true that listeners were well motivated. Yes. Um, and that ought to be taken into, into consideration with adaptation experiments. Um, so yes, perhaps we're seeing the best that we can get. On, on, the other, on the other hand, we as listeners, if we're adapting in everyday life, are pretty motivated too. 
to understand what's going on, right? So I think it's, we, I think we're still employing the same mechanisms. And I think it's probably fair to say that the adaptation that's been observed in the past, even though it's in blocks, would, would have used similar, similarly motivated listeners. Now, you also asked the question about bilingual listeners. Um, so the listeners were all, I say, studying English mainly in their second year of study. They were studying English, English studies. So in, in particular, they were familiar with um, phonetics. And so they would naturally have an interest, I guess. So yes, again, that kind of optimizes the situation. So it'd be interesting to repeat this with students or from participants in general, from other disciplines, perhaps. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, because I was also very motivated, but I haven't been able to adapt to any of your examples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, sure. Well, I mean, there's also the, the WebEx platform in the way and so on. And if maybe, you do, maybe. I mean, you need I, to... I would think it's that and not my inability to, <laughs> yeah. to adapt. It's also the case that there's a huge across participant variability in, in terms of side wave speech in particular and tone vocoded speech. Some people just almost never adapt to it, others adapt really quickly. Um, uh -huh. I've heard it so for so many years now, for at least 25 years, that I feel as I kind of it's my second language, side wave speech, and <laughs> Amish will be my third or something. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does anyone have any question? No? Then uh, we will maybe leave it here. Thank you, Martin, again, for this very interesting talk. Um, yeah, there's a question. Huh? There's a question from here. Maybe, is, is there a question? Yeah, this is Shifas, Martin. Oh, hi, Shifas. Oh, hi, Shifas. Uh, so the the thing is that yes, we see here there is a right rapid adaptation at the beginning, like two point five or three, and then two people are listening. Mm -hmm. So whenever we do the evaluation or say intelligibility or any test for different methods to evaluate different systems, yeah, how to eliminate this bias in the response? Or say should we play some initial samples at a different noise or work condition? That's a that's a a very good question. In fact, so this is really inverting the the issue where we are interested in the rapid adaptation. If you're interested in intelligibility in the steady state, then you really do want to eliminate this rapid phase. And so what people have been doing in sense by default in the past by using familiarization stimuli is indeed to eliminate rapid adaptation. Although as you can see, there's still a slow component. So if you I think the the more dissimilar to everyday experience your stimuli are. So if you're testing, for instance, uh, different kinds of speech synthesizers, for example, or different kinds of intelligibility enhancement algorithms, I think you're still going to get adaptation even after 30, 40, 50 sentences, but it will be much reduced. What's more, you can, you'll be able to see it in your data as well. So I'd encourage everybody to actually analyze the data at the level of individual sentences. Okay. Could you hear that? Could you hear a bit of feedback. Okay. Uh, I have also a question. Yes. Sir. So uh, you shown us uh, uh, many types of distortions. One of them, I think, was fast speech, right? Yeah. And I have um, uh, tried to do a lot of experiments um, the last years with fast speech. And always, I think it's very hard for me to adapt to the, the fast speech. Uh, other people, however, they use it every day because they uh, they need it. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering if um, you see such uh, a, a keyword score adaptation as I see here in your uh, slides. Uh, so very fast. Uh, with fast speech that we adapt and we understand. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about, let's say, 600 words per minute. 600 words a minute. That's pretty fast, yeah. Yeah, well, th these were 2.5 times speed up. So I guess that's, we're, we're looking at that kind of 450 to 600 words a minute, possibly. Um, I also find it quite difficult to adapt to fast speech. I think there's a, 
there's a, again a, a large individual component to this. Also, nowadays, people tend to fast forward the way through YouTube videos, for instance. Um, so run them at sort of 1.5, two times the speed. So people may have actually inadvertently, from our point of view, received a, a more experience than we're giving them credit for with fast speech. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think indeed it's fast speech is um, depends how fast it is. It can be very difficult for adaptation uh, for 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 let's say people like us. Even if it is, for instance, for me Greek or for you for English, British English. Mm -hmm. um, but there are uh, people who work with screen readers, mm -hmm. uh, blind uh, users, and they can very easily go to 600 even 800 words per minute and they are perfect i mean they cannot tell you exactly what uh, has been said so this is an amazing uh, and and i don't think all people all of us we can the rest of us we can adapt so quickly to such distortions i yeah. even call it distortions yeah i mean i don't want to give the simple idea that i think that we, this is sort of ongoing adaptation and that's all there is Clearly, if you're going to be listening to screen readers for hours each day, then you're almost certainly going to be forming new representations of words. Not yeah. so. I think there's going to be different, you know, overlaid timescales here of adaptation that is almost immediate, um, an adaptation which results in long long term effects. Essentially, I think that's one of the going to be the key differences with experience here. And the same, I think, will be true. Well, clearly listeners who receive cochlear implants um a case in point where the adap that adaptation is going to be highly individual specific even down to where the electrodes what frequencies are being conveyed and so on and one would expect to see long-term improvement so isn't i don't want to give the impression that you know nine cent nine nine words later and we've you know got half way to where we're going to get to i think it's i think there's all the time scales of adaptation here, but right. I'm really focusing on the very short time scales here. Okay, thank you so much for the talk. And the talk. Thank, you. thank you. Okay, is there any more question? I think all the doubts have been cleared. So, uh, thank you, Martin, for the talk. It has been really, really interesting. And thank you all for attending the seminar. You know that there will be another one this month. And uh, we, will, we will keep you uh, informed. Okay? So, thanks. Thank you, Evers. Thank uh, you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. It was a pleasure. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.